I asked you right now to picture a poem, to picture a poem as words on a page, you would probably be picturing something like this. That's because line breaks are one of the major features which distinguish poetry from prose. The poet Mary Oliver described the distinction like this. Prose is printed or written within the confines of margins, while poetry is written in lines that do not necessarily pay any attention to the margins, especially the right margin. White space can take the place of a beat, just like a rest in music, and like white space in visual art, it impacts the shape of the poem on the page, drawing our attention to certain words and phrases and creating emphasis. Line and stanza breaks along with punctuation determine the length and duration and timing of pauses. So first, it's important to establish how to properly read a poem out loud. So just like in prose, of course you pause for punctuation, commas, periods, etc. Pausing for punctuation is probably not something you have to think about at this point in your life as a reader, but it is something that you consciously do. On some level, it's something you make yourself do. In contrast, you really shouldn't put any effort into pausing for line or stanza breaks. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be a pause, however. There will be a natural pause as your eyes have to move across the page. As far as how long the duration of those pauses is, there's a little bit of debate around that. I personally think it should be shorter than the length of a comma pause because again, you're not so much trying to pause as you are forced to pause by the form of the poem. Poets can also put white space at the beginning of a line, in the middle of a line, really anywhere. And the greater the white space is, the longer the pause will be. Line breaks fall into two distinct categories which are determined by punctuation or lack thereof. Lines which end in punctuation are called end-stopped. Lines which do not end in punctuation are called enjammed. And the technique of continuing a sentence without a pause beyond the end of a line, couplet, or stanza is called enjambment. Now I just said you're not supposed to consciously pause at the end of a line break, so what exactly does enjambment do? What purpose does the white space at the end of an enjam line serve? Well. A lot of purposes, as I will argue in this video. One thing enjambment does is it forces you as a reader to consider the meaning of each line on its own, even as you are also considering the meaning of the sentence, the grammatical sentence as a whole. For example, I'm going to read an excerpt from a Tracy K. Smith poem. This is called, I Don't Miss It. We hear so much about what love feels like. Right now, today, with the rain outside, and leaves that want as much as I do to believe in May, in seasons that come when called, it's impossible not to want to walk into the next room and let you run your hands down the sides of my legs, knowing perfectly well what they know. So those are eight lines, and seven of those eight lines are one grammatical sentence. Keep in mind, she could have broken that sentence up any which way, so why did she break the lines where she did? For one thing, line breaks tend to draw our attention to the final words of a line. So for example, Right now, today, with the rain outside, and leaves that want as much as I do to believe, that creates emphasis on believe, which draws our attention to that internal rhyme with leaves. What about the lines, it's impossible not to want to walk into the next room? Why break it up that way? Well, notice that it's impossible not to want is a full grammatical sentence in its own right. And placing that sentence on its own line causes us to think about the meaning of that sentence within the broader sentence, it's impossible not to want to walk into the next room. And the sentence, it's impossible not to want, is a universal truth. <laughs> so we're thinking about that broad universal truth even as we're also considering the more specific lines, it's impossible not to want to walk into the next room, etc. Finally, the pause at the end of that enjammed line causes us to think about what's going to happen next. And that brings me to the next important thing that enjambment does, which is create tension. Rebecca Hazelton, writing for the Poetry Foundation, wrote this of enjambment. Withholding, of meaning at the end of the enjam line, produces a subtle kind of mystery or anxiety as I'm not quite sure what each line means until I continue reading the next one. Stephen Dobbins argued something similar, although he called this tension as opposed to mystery or anxiety. He wrote, when a line is broken at a piece of punctuation or a natural pause, that break creates a rest. When a line is broken between pauses or pieces of punctuation, that creates tension. So even in a brief pause, you as the reader have the opportunity to consider what might come next. You can form expectations, and wherever there are expectations, there's the opportunity to subvert them. It reminds me a little bit of picture books, children's picture books. You'll notice that the most destabilized tense moments in a picture book occur on the right-hand page, so that we are thinking, wondering about what's gonna happen next as we turn the page. And now, obviously, line breaks are a much shorter pause than that, but it is functioning much like any other form of artistic negative space. 
Another comparison which comes to mind is the comedic technique of the setup and the punchline. You'll notice that the pause between the setup and the punchline is doing a lot of comedic work. A lot of stand-up comics really draw out that pause. They do things with their facial expressions. They're playing with the tension of our expectations. And often enjambment does lead to wordplay, irony, and other forms of humor. A great example of this is Heather Crystal's poem Optioned. It uses a ton of white space and it really wouldn't be the same poem without the white space. This is an excerpt from that poem. What does a house do? That's easy. It houses. Just as a cloud pulls the light from a face when someone utters mortgage. In any other world, a sweet name for a daughter, beginning as it does with a little death. Practically every line of this poem subverts our expectations. The space, the white space, the pauses allows expectations to form just so that Heather Crystal can essentially break those expectations down. As I said before, breaking lines in particular ways can draw connections between specific words, which can emphasize sound techniques like rhyme, but also alliteration, consonants, assonance. So let's take a closer look at this poem. What does a house do? That's easy. It houses. Funny. Just as a cloud. This space is interesting. It draws attention to the slant rhyme, I think, between house and cloud. They don't exactly rhyme, but they have those repeated O-U sounds in the middle. It houses just as a cloud. The line break after cloud does something interesting too. It makes us think that she's saying that clouds house things, which is strange. Pulls the light from a face when someone utters mortgage. Hilarious. I mean, there's just no way that was what you expected her to say. In any other world, a sweet name for a daughter. Again, this is unexpected, but it's logical when you think about it. Okay, you think about the word mortgage, don't think about what it means. It kind of sounds like a name, kind of sounds like Morgan or something. Beginning as it does with a little death. We end on an aha moment. You probably already know, le petit mort is French for a little death, which means orgasm, which is also how you get daughters. Which is brilliant, brilliant, Heather. <laughs> And just to drive home the importance of line breaks, let's look at how this poem would read if I ruined it with bad line breaks. What does a house do? That's easy. It houses. Just as a cloud pulls the light from a face when someone utters mortgage. In any other world, a sweet name for a daughter beginning as it does with a little death. I haven't completely ruined the poem. Heather Crystal's words are still very meaningful and interesting and beautiful, but we don't get the same emphasis between the similarity of house and cloud. All the jokes are compressed and less effective and there's no real emphasis on that amazing final line. I've complained before about poets, amateur poets, creating space between their final lines too often when it's not warranted, but here I think it's really earned. I mean, it does feel like a mic drop, but I feel like, you know, if you deserve a mic drop, by all means, drop the mic. Hopefully by now I've convinced you of the importance and effectiveness of line breaks and white space when used effectively, so I'm just going to give you some practical advice to end on. Once again, I'm going to reference a blog post I really like that I've referenced before called Dear Bad Writers, Read This Poetic Line Break Guide. In it, the author, Hannah Huff, suggests not to end lines on articles, conjunctions, prepositions, or pronouns. She gives her specific reasoning for each one of those parts of speech, but I'd say in general, they're just not really words you want to emphasize. They're not going to offer a lot of sound opportunities because they're short. These are just not the star players of the English language. We don't really need to draw attention to them. She argues instead that you you should end on interesting nouns and verbs, but also notes that ending a line on a less interesting noun or verb can sort of enliven it as well. Let's look again at Heather Crystal's poem as an example. I recommend you read the entire thing, and if you do read the entire thing, these are the words that she ends each line on. Director, author, has, not so interesting, money, spoon, ass, well, that makes a nice sound with has, so maybe that's why she decided to end on has. Embarrassment, own, do, easy, houses, cloud, face, mortgage, world, name, daughter, does, death. So, mostly nouns and verbs. Let's look at the Tracy K. Smith poem. Like, outside, believe, called, want, you, legs, no. This is a fun exercise that you could try. You could open up any poetry collection that you like and you can look at the last word of each line. You can also look at any time the poet in jams a line or any time they use white space and what impact that's having on the meaning of the poem. Are they mostly using nouns and verbs or do they sometimes use conjunctions, prepositions, articles? If they do, does there seem to be an interesting reason why? That's all for now. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe. Bye!